This video is brought to you by NordVPN. So in case you somehow haven't heard of this company, then A, you haven't watched my channel enough, and B, you're in luck because NordVPN is here to help you take back control of your internet experience. And they're having a limited time Black Friday sale. None of us want creeps, be it shady individuals or companies, snooping on our data. And that's especially true this year when more than ever we're stuck online with nothing else to do. With NordVPN, you'll be completely set thanks to their super fast servers, 24 seven customer support, unlimited bandwidth, and a top notch military grade encryption. Head on over to nordvpn.com slash rainbot to take advantage of this limited time deal and use promo code rainbot for 68% off a two year plan, plus four whole additional months absolutely free. Yes, you're getting a chunk of the year for absolutely nothing extra. And if you're unconvinced for whatever reason, NordVPN also has a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash rainbot and promo code rainbot for 68% off a two-year plan plus four months absolutely free. Children are the very definition of innocence, and it's hard to imagine them being capable of anything remotely close to what adults describe as evil. Even suggesting that a child could do something intentionally malicious is bound to ruffle up some feathers, but if we dig deep enough, there exist tales that paint a much different picture. One of the most notorious examples of this centers around a 10-year-old girl named Mary Bell. Back in the 60s, Mary strangled two toddlers to death on two separate occasions. And in case you were wondering if there maybe was some kind of misunderstanding, there was not. After murdering her second victim, Mary later returned to mutilate his corpse. But there's a good chance you probably already knew about this case, so today we're going to talk about a similar story that took place thousands of miles away and decades later. One that unfolded as the modern internet was forming, leading to a new kind of infamy for the person in question. When you hear the name Nagasaki, it's almost impossible to picture anything other than tragedy, and unfortunately, this story is right in line with that theme. More specifically, this tale brings us back to the summer of 2004, to a city within Nagasaki called Sasebo. The day was June 1st, and the 6th grade class at Okubo Elementary School was getting ready for their lunch break. Nothing seemed all that out of the ordinary, aside from one small detail. The teacher in charge of the class noticed that two of her female students had gone missing, and while this was odd, it wasn't necessarily an immediate cause for concern. But little did they know, just next door, in an empty classroom, tragedy was about to strike. Just as the students were about to dig in, one of the two missing girls reappeared, but something was very, very wrong with her. She was covered with blood, and in her hand was an equally bloodied box cutter. The teacher feared the worst, that the little girl had taken the blade to herself, but that's when she said something that no one saw coming. This isn't my blood. The little girl then pointed down the hallway, and that's when what had happened became clear. The other missing girl, 12-year-old Satomi Mitarai, was found face down in her own blood with a deep four-inch gash on her neck, along with several other slashes on her arms and hands. By this point, the school staff were in a panicked frenzy, but unfortunately, there was nothing that they or the paramedics could do to save the young girl's life. Satomi bled to death right there on the floor of her very own school. Meanwhile, the girl responsible for her murder, now legally dubbed Girl A, was interviewed by police, and that's when the full story began to unfold. Sobbing, Girl A explained that she had managed to lure Satomi into the classroom simply by asking her. A quick, come here for a second, was enough to get Satomi into the room and seated while Girl A drew the curtain shut. 
Girl A then stood behind Satomi, put her hands over Satomi's eyes, and then drove the box cutter deep into her throat, causing her to flail before the attack continued. To make things even more disturbing, Girl A didn't head to the classroom to alert her teacher immediately after this. In fact, there was actually about a 15 minute gap where Girl A simply stood there and watched Satomi bleed out. None of this made sense for an 11-year-old girl to carry out, something so calculated and malicious. The adults of the community were left stunned, confused even. At that moment, it was most likely close to impossible to even make sense of what had just happened. While trying to rationalize this story, one might ask if maybe this was actually a freak accident that simply looked like a murder. After all, an 11-year-old girl might not know how to spell out the difference while in panic over what happened, but unfortunately, that was not the case. As it turns out, the two girls had a checkered past, and at the center of the conflict was the internet. According to Girl A, Satomi had made mean comments about her online and was a bit of a bully. At some point, for reasons that are ultimately unknown, Girl A snapped, and that's when she actually began to premeditate this murder. This was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. In fact, Girl A even weighed out her options and drew up a plan of action in her head over the previous weekend. Keep in mind, these girls were 11 and 12 years old, and it goes without saying that most childhood conflicts do not result in murder. Panic parents tried to wrap their heads around why this happened, but finding out the answer proved to be infinitely complicated. By all accounts, Girl A was considered normal by the school staff and didn't have any obvious issues. However, during her trial, Girl A was diagnosed with a developmental disorder, something challenged by other doctors. The thing is though, even if the diagnosis was correct, it would be both inaccurate and irresponsible to blame this crime solely on her condition. In 2005, a Japanese journalist by the name of Atsuko Kusanagi released a book detailing this case, and said book has provided the bulk of information for both this video and several other sources. In it, Kusanagi brings up accusations against Girl A's father, who was suspected of abuse, something that he denied multiple times when approached by local media. Still, this offers no real solutions, as most people who have experienced trauma don't end up turning into killers. During times of mourning, when a clear answer isn't available, we humans have a tendency to fall into moral panic, blaming any convenient scapegoat that we can for some temporary relief. In this case, much like so many others, Girl A's interests and hobbies were dissected and subsequently blamed for what happened. Especially of note was Girl A's love of the horror genre. Her room was found with novels like The Ring and One Miss Call, but what stuck out the most was her interest in Battle Royale, which, if you're not aware, is a novel and film about a class forced to fight to the death until only one remains. Think Hunger Games, but from the 90s and rated R. The Nagasaki Shimbun reported just days after the murder that Girl A was a fan of both the novel and film adaptation, and what really caught people's attention was the fact that in May of that year, the little girl even wrote Battle Royale fanfiction. The same article also mentions another bit of horror fiction found bookmarked on Girl A's computer, an internet urban legend called The Red Room. Now, if you've heard of this term, then you might be thinking of the dark web and snuff livestreams, but this version is a bit different. Instead, it involves somewhat of a curse that finds its victims via an online pop-up ad, one that asks, do you like the Red Room? Now, I'm not going to go into full details about this, but if you want to know more about this specific topic, then I highly suggest this video by Nihongo Johnny. But anyway, the Red Room curse's ultimate consequence is that its victim would commit suicide, resulting in a room drenched in blood, hence a Red Room. Again, this is essentially just a creepypasta and was also adapted into a Flash game. All things considered, it's not really all that unusual that Girl A, who was already a fan of horror, would also be into something like this as well. Parents could blame whatever scapegoat they wanted, but that ultimately wouldn't help preventing anything 
something like this from happening again. In fact, this incident wasn't even the first time this happened in the area. According to the New York Times, just a year earlier in a nearby town, a 12-year-old boy was accused of kidnapping, molesting, and then murdering a toddler. And in 2001, Japan lowered its age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 14. This following the 1997 beheading of a 10-year-old boy at the hands of a 14-year-old. The case of Girl A, now known as the Sasebo slashing, reignited the national dialogue, leading many to question if the legal age of criminal responsibility had to be lowered yet again, but that ultimately never happened. As I mentioned earlier, the little girl who killed her classmate was legally dubbed Girl A. This was due to Japanese law and the fact that the killer was a minor. Her identity was never supposed to be revealed, but a Japanese TV station covering her story accidentally doxed her after showing B-roll of her schoolwork, which was signed. The station simply neglected to censor it, and that's when the internet got involved and gave Girl A a new nickname. Class photos featuring both Girl A and Satomi were leaked online, and in them, Girl A was usually seen wearing this hoodie, one from the University of Nevada in the US. It's unclear what connection Girl A had to the university, if any, but nonetheless, it became part of her user-generated online persona. And while her real name had been leaked online, she would instead be dubbed Nevadatan by users all over the world. Nevada, obviously due to her hoodie, and Tan, a baby talk version of the Chan honorific suffix. Soon enough, Nevada Tan became a full-blown early meme, complete with fan art and cosplay, many finding something humorous about the idea that such a small girl was capable of doing something so grisly. And in case you had any doubts about how widespread this was at the time, the University of Nevada had to stop selling the hoodies Girl A was wearing after they became their best-selling item, obviously for all the wrong reasons. Nevadatan was dubbed the, quote, cutest killer in Japan, and if you watched my last Stories from Our Disturbing World video, then you'll recall a similar instance where a girl who tried to kill her boyfriend went viral and was dubbed the, quote, most beautiful killer. In both cases, it's practically impossible to tell what's trolling and what's genuine admiration, and while that may be confusing to a lot of people, you could also argue that it isn't exactly surprising, given that it's the internet. It's not news to anyone that edgy humor, just for the sake of being edgy, is kind of a hallmark of the online world. Still, these online users, of course, were pretty far removed from the reality of what happened, and anyone living in Sasebo City would probably feel a lot different about it. In fact, the incident has had lasting effects on the area, and especially the campus where the murders took place. The school decided to designate the anniversary of Satomi's death as basically a life appreciation day, where young students gather together and are taught by the staff to value life and to be kind to one another, although they don't explicitly say why or how that tradition started. Now, that may sound a little overkill, but 10 years after Satomi was murdered, another student on student slaying happened yet again in Sasebo City. This time, the girls involved were a few years older, and the actual murder itself happened off campus, but nonetheless, old wounds were once again reopened. That case and the 2004 incident weren't connected, and Sasebo doesn't necessarily see more violent juvenile crime than anywhere else in the world, but given all of this, plus the other unrelated cases, it's kind of easy to see how parents might resort to moral panic even if it's illogical. In the end, it may be a tough pill to swallow, but there is no guaranteed way to predict these things, no way to prevent tragedy from striking, and for many, that very fact alone is paralyzing. In 2008, Girl A, or by that point Nevadatan, was released and rejoined the general population with a new name and presumably a new path in life. As for where she is now, no one really knows, but one can only hope that she never hurts anyone else ever again. Today's video would not have been possible without the help of every single one of my supporters on Patreon, but especially these people. 
T. Gorman, Connor H., W. H., Zoe Chazales, K. M. B. K. Ketchup, Wayback Exploration, Ronnie, T. B. F., Salabarka, Michelle G., Guilty Pleasures, Corey Barks, David G., Catherine L., A. J. Runaway, P. D. Gunn, Astro, Tyler T., Sean the C. H. B., Bloody the Elf, Andrew L., Esper Nix, Eric M., Brandon F., Daniel G., Ulysses, Lance, Layla R., Dave P., Chris R., Bath Time Duck, Mr. Gamer BBQ, Zimbledorf, the Calzone Consumer, Rai Sparrow, Tristan J, Francisco B, Jake J, Sky Grinder, It's Mitt, Yellow for Jesus, Luck B, Scorian S, Benjamin M, Nick B, Melody, SPC, Zippo, Keith Z, Matt J, Jane, and Sarai. Again, everyone, thank you so much for listening, and I apologize for the audio in this whole thing. I've moved to a new recording area, and it's still very echoey. But anyway, I'll see you all soon.